Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, New York gun legislation and Brooklyn's youngest street artist, as in nine years old. Hi and welcome to the show, I'm Ashley Ford and today is International Women's Day. The first of the Me Too era, the second after the inaugural Women's March, and the first that feels like we're all talking about some valid shit. Women's empowerment, women running for office, women organizing opposition to injustice or to influence policy. I salute all you women out there who are demanding to be heard. I think they're hearing us, but we still have a pay gap. Women still make 20% less than men for the same job. We lack adequate representation. Fewer than 20% of U.S. Congress members are women. And there are still challenges to our reproductive rights. Vice President Pence saying abortion in the U.S. will end in our time. And we still don't have an equal rights amendment, unlike 134 other countries, including Chad, Russia, and Turkmenistan, a country that has men in its frickin' name, and on and on and on. Now, I don't think I'm being cynical when I say none of us knows what will or won't happen in our time. Our time could end in a year, tomorrow, or within the hour. I'm less concerned with what will be true 50 years from now and more concerned with who among us stands and fights for the rights of women, half the world population, right now. If you count yourself in that group, then happy International Women's Day. If you don't, well, I guess we'll check in and see how you feel about that 50 years from now. Coming up on the show today, another talk about guns and what's going on in the state to keep them more or less in our hands or under our shirts. And then a Brooklyn-based tagger under 10, the world's youngest street artist. But first, these things. NYC has appointed its first nightlife mayor, and no, sadly, it's not me. It's Ariel Pollitz, whose list of qualifications, per reports, include having been a member of a community board, running the door at the now-shuttered Mars Club, owning a bar for 10 years, and living in the East Village. Do I sound bitter? Nah. Even if she's gonna make six figures for hanging out at bars and clubs. No, it sounds like it will be an actual job, mediating conflicts and making sure that New York's nightlife stays signature. Ariel, we wish you well and hope to have you on the show. And let's not forget that today is also National Proofreading Day, a day devoted to bringing heightened awareness to the vast cultural benefits provided by proofreading and proofreaders, of which I imagine Brooklyn has many. Don't know how to observe? Just make sure you proofread everything. Like for example, when Ross wrote this, he made proofreading two words, but we proofread it and fixed the mistake. By the way, the day was created by a corporate trainer in honor of her mother's love of correcting people. And remember the NRA fundraiser that was canceled in Brooklyn? A similar one is being scheduled for later in the year now in Staten Island, which seems a better fit since it has the highest gun permit concentration in the city. Like the one in Brooklyn, Staten Island friends of NRA plan to raffle guns. So, happy hunting. Stay tuned for our first guest. We talked a couple of weeks ago, post-Parkland shooting, about the reflexive Republican, read NRA, response that mass shootings are a mental health issue. I hope that one day we'll be able to put that talking point to rest, and if we do, our next guest will have played a prominent role. We called him back today to talk more about guns, and this time about their presence in New York and legislation being proposed in the State House. Jonathan Metzl, welcome back to 112VK. Thanks so much. It's great to be back. It's always fantastic to have you, even though the circumstances are not always awesome that we're speaking under. Maybe things are changing now, so... Let's hope. <laughs> it feels like the gun control movement has gained some traction over these past several weeks post-Parkland. Um, since we last spoke, it seems like I'm seeing more conversations about it, I'm seeing more media about it, more interviews. The teenagers out of Parkland are really blowing my mind. What are you seeing? Well, I, I agree with that very much. I mean, I think that 
there have been two major factors and then a couple of kind of movings of ground that we wouldn't have thought of before. I think the two major factors, first of all, is that the teenagers from Parkland have started a movement, a Never Again movement, where people are really getting involved. And I think what they've become is kind of the mouthpiece for a lot of frustration that had been brewing um, across the country, not just after mass shootings where people felt like the same thing kept happening again and again oh, yes. and nothing was done, but also about just the epidemic rates of everyday violence. And so I think what they've done is allowed people to speak out and in a way combat the learned helplessness that I think a lot of people had felt mm -hmm. across the country. So in that sense, that that's, I think, a huge part of the issue. And I think second, as a result, people are becoming just much more educated about firearms in society. Not to say we're going to go take away people's guns or anything, right. but really what kind of policies work, what's the terrain, what's the real reach of organizations like the NRA, and how can we combat that? So I think right. in general, there's just a lot more knowledge. And that seems to be starting to filter down into state houses and places where we never would have seen that. I mean, there's movement in places like Oregon and Washington mm -hmm. State um, that I think are important, uh, banning bump stocks, uh, making it harder for people convicted of domestic violence to mm -hmm. own weapons. So I think those are important loopholes. And even over the last couple of days, we've seen movement in Florida, a very, very pro-gun state, oh, to yeah. enact some real common sense measures. I saw a video this morning of one of their representatives talking about how uh, kids don't get to decide was what happens in Florida because kids aren't in this room and kids aren't lawmakers <laughs> and I'm like you just inspired a lot of kids to show up to vote in the fall, but okay. Well, and the, um, and the other part of that is that really, I don't think that that, I think the NRA is going to have to come up with some new strategies, because I think this message of we're not giving an inch on anything, mm -hmm. it's just not, it's not the compelling story. I don't think that's no. where people are at right now. It's really like, yeah. how can we create a world where we respect people's gun rights, but also create safer societies? And so yeah. I think they need a new playbook, to be honest. They do need a new playbook. Let's talk about New York's playbook. There's a bill up for debate right now that would allow concealed reciprocity in the state, which basically means if you have a concealed carry license almost anywhere else in the country, that you would then be able to conceal carry in New York, even though that is not necessarily legal here. What are your thoughts on that? I think um, I think it's a disaster <laughs> when yeah. it happened, to be honest. Right. Um, I, I think when, when President Trump was first elected, mm -hmm. there was a sense among the NRA and people who were kind of supporting, not gun owners, that's an important distinction, really the corporate the corporate gun lobby, mm -hmm. uh, that basically this was going to be an open an open open season for all gun laws. And there were there was talk about overturning the Hughes Amendment, letting people own uh, machine guns and all these mm -hmm. other kind of crazy things. And concealed carry reciprocity, I think, was one of the big issues that the NRA was really pushing. And the idea was basically, I'm coming from Tennessee. There are very liberal gun laws in Tennessee. I can fill up a suitcase with Glocks and AR-15s mm -hmm. and then come to New York and and I, I wouldn't be subject to the gun laws of New York. I would be subject to the gun laws of Tennessee. And it seems like that's kind of a terrible idea for a, a number of reasons. Right. One is, you know, the terrifying prospect that you're going to have all these armed ter uh, tourists, mm -hmm. <laughs> armed tourists uh, at places oh, yeah. like, um, you know, New Year's Eve, Times Square with my Glock and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But the other thing is when people come to cities like New York that have strict gun laws, guns have high high um, illegal sale value, right? Mm -hmm. And so it also leads to the breakdown of states' and cities' abilities to regulate their own gun laws. Right. And so in that sense, I think it's just a horrible idea. But, I, you know, I think what, one encouraging thing is the concealed carry reciprocity movement actually passed a vote of Congress, mm -hmm. and it's kind of it's on the launch pad for the Senate. But I have to say, given the attitude of the country right now, I can't imagine that passing. I mean, it's just such an obviously terrible idea. Right. That, you know, hopefully the terrain has changed, but I think it's something that's very, very important for New Yorkers uh, and people in, in big cities across the country, mm -hmm. Los Angeles, same thing, places that have seen the success of limiting particular um, carry and, and ownership of particular guns right. really to pay attention to. Right, absolutely. And the State Assembly just passed a bill of committee that would limit, I believe, some people's ability to purchase a gun do you know more about that or where that is or how that works? Yeah, well, I think, I think you know, New York's a great example, right? We have right. tremendous population density. We have all kinds of different people interacting, butting up against each other, right. um, you know, in very, I think, lovable ways. For the most part, arguing with, you, with each other on the subway, uh, in the softball games that I play in or pick up basketball games, right. things like that. And part of the issue is I think New York, in the American context, is an example of what, what, what successful 
um, successful gun laws look like, which is mm -hmm. that there are pathways to own firearms in New York. And it's harder to carry a gun, for example, in New York City than it is in upstate New York. And so what we've done is we've, we've created a set of laws that make it that make it just kind of play to our local needs. Dense mm -hmm. urban areas, it should be harder to have, have a concealed weapon. You should have to have a permit. You right. should be able to, um, you know, look at, at things that people at risk. Um, mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I feel like it's unbelievably successful. And the new batches of legislation, I think, further that. And the, the basic premise of this new legislation is that you, can, you know, imagine you're a doctor or you're a police officer. You're seeing somebody for five seconds who mm -hmm. might be at risk. You don't know how, how threatening they were last week or last month. It really right. is family members, regular pe people who, you know, partners, domestic partners, mm -hmm. who can see somebody escalating. And so I think what these new, this new legislation is saying is that there should be an avenue for family members mm -hmm. um, and partners um, to, to basically alert authorities that people that they love or are close right. to are escalating and that at that point there's a kind of relooking of should that person have a firearm. So it's in line with what's called a gun violence restraining order. Right. And I think a, ve I get a very important tool for a number of reasons, but one key one is that domestic of domestic abuse is a huge issue and so it, it gives more power to to women who are being uh, uh, the victims of abuse to say take this person take my partner's gun away yes please take my partner's yeah. gun away in a situation like that so how would you in evaluate new york gun laws overall in terms of just i mean let let's just stick to this country yeah please <laughs> <laughs> how are we doing well i th i think that i think that there's really very little debate about about this that i think that mm -hmm. regions not just states but regions that as a, as a region enact reasonable common sense gun gun laws mm -hmm. have lower rates of every kind of gun violence lower mm -hmm. rates of gun suicide um, partner violence shootings of police now homicides. when you say regions is that why the New York City to Chicago comparison doesn't really absolutely okay. It's such a trick. It's such a trick question in in a certain right. kind of way because New York, first of all, especially after Sandy Hook and passage of what's called the Safe Act and other mm -hmm. factors like that, really did did a, a, I think a very bold move in terms of regulating particular kinds of firearms, particular kinds of magazines, mm -hmm. and also importantly regulated not just long guns, not just uh, assault rifles, but handguns because right. handguns cause the most the most death in this country. Mm -hmm. And so New York by itself passed I think reasonably strict gun laws, but it's also part of a region where if you go to Connecticut, if you go to Massachusetts, other other states around in the area also have relatively strict gun laws. Right. Um, Chicago, by comparison, I, it just drives me bonkers when people say, well, Chicago's an example of failed gun, gun laws, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. The, mm -hmm. the, matter, the, the truth is, Chicago has gun laws that are also similarly very strict, but if you're in Chicago, you have to drive, I think it's 22 minutes to go to Indiana, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. It's about like 22 that. minutes. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, in a way, all you have to do is drive across straight lines. You can mm -hmm. load up your car, uh, you know, theoretically speaking, with, with weapons. Yeah. So, in a way, Chicago can't can't regulate its own gun laws. Uh, I mean, it, it can, but it can't because it's just far too easy for people to circumvent the system. Right. And the other issue is that there are huge loopholes in gun laws and background checks. For example, gun shows, uh, you don't need to have a background check. It's very easy to get a, a weapon. Right. So in a way, Chicago shows why it's a, a gun, gun violence prevention is a regional issue mm -hmm. in addition to being a state issue. Absolutely. And you know, people have been discussing a lot of different ways to fix this, right? They're talking about banning bump stocks. They're talking about arming teachers. They're talking about, you know, banning assault rifles, raising the age that you have to be. Are these things going to be helpful? Or, I mean, I, I guess, I'm guessing some of them can be or will be, but other ones I am not super <laughs> encouraged by, especially arming teachers. What are you, like, where are you on those? Well, um, <laughs> I'm kind of predictable about this. I mean, yeah. I would say on one hand, um, I can understand the emotional response, mm -hmm. um, the emotional response, particularly of banning assault rifles, because assault rifles are causing all of this death and mass shootings, and they're inc very important symbols of our own powerlessness. And so in that sense, right. I think banning assault rifles, I can understand why it has the symbolic valence that it does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's important. Um, banning teachers, uh, I think, is... is um, is, um, Arming teachers. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Don't yeah. ban them. Yeah, let's ban teachers. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, <laughs> we if, if we ban teachers, then we'd uh, you know not have armed teachers. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, I, I would say that you know 
I just think that arming teachers brings more guns into schools. And yeah. so even though that might make some emotional sense, all you're doing is adding the, the, the so-called environmental hazard, the gun. You're oh, just yeah. putting more guns in schools. So for oh, me, yeah. there's no evidence that that's going to work. And it's not surprising to me why the NRA and President Trump and other people are pushing this. I think that what it does is it just creates the market for more guns, right? And so yes. in a way, I think that's beneath a lot of this. And mm -hmm. it creates an emotional sense that schools are embattled zones, when right. really, I think what you need to be doing is making the opposite case, that schools are safer, more accepting. And so in that mm -hmm. sense, I think that it's a really bad idea to arm teachers. Now, right. I do think there are things on the docket right now that are important and mm -hmm. will make a difference. One is this idea of a waiting period, a three-day waiting period mm -hmm. for, gun, for gun sales. That's one of the things that's, on, on, that's being proposed in Florida. Right. And the reason that's important is because so much gun violence, and particularly gun suicide, is incredibly impulsive, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody finds out that somebody's having an affair, they got fired, they just want to rush off and get a gun and do something horrible, or right. they're in a conflict, they want to run. So having a kind of cooling off period, this is not a new idea, and it's something that had, it used to have Republican support. Uh, President Reagan used to support a three-day period yep. and things like that. And so yep. in that sense, I think a waiting period is a fantastic idea and mm -hmm. will, it will, be, will kind of stem this tide of impulsive gun violence. Um, I, I also think that background checks, if we can kind of nationalize the background check policy, yes. what you're doing is you're identifying identifying high-risk people and communities. And so it creates, again, if we can if we can make it much more efficient and mm -hmm. close some of the loopholes, I think that back, the literature on background checks really has shown that states that enact uh, effective background check measures see about a 50% drop in pretty much all kinds of gun violence, including suicides, including shootings of police officers. And so I think people should get around this because, again, this is something we do for automobiles and other things that we are regulated. Do. Yeah, so. We do. I'm sorry we ran out of time for this conversation in the broadcast, but if you want to hear more about the NRA and more of Jonathan's thoughts on gun laws, just tune in to the podcast. <laughs>
like a Disney Pixar character. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the drawings from other artists will show up. Yeah. So I tried drawing one of like a few people with my own style. Did you like the way it turned out? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe because I drew them little. Yeah. But that might be it. Yeah, because I, I drew like five on one page. Right. I'm still trying to learn how to draw small things, right? Like, I'm a person who, I, I'm not like you, Lola. I have no artistic talent. I try really hard, or at least I do now. But it's been really tough for me to learn how to draw small things. And you draw big things when you do graffiti. You make these things that are taller than you. How do you get to a place where you draw that big? Is it hard, is it challenging, or do you find it even easier than drawing the little stuff? It's a little bit of easy and challenging because mm -hmm. like the challenging part is seeing where all the stuff goes because a lot of time, like most of the time you have to scoot back and mm -hmm. see your wall and sometimes there's like something blocking it so you can't see the part you're working on. Mm -hmm. It's especially tough when it comes to the faces because mm -hmm. like with the eyes, the eyes is really, really hard. Yeah. Because I have my own way of doing really detailed eyes and sometimes it's really challenging because mm -hmm. maybe either I can't see the eyes or I do one eye one way and the other different. Mm -hmm. Like either one of those ways, but it's just really hard. And it's really awesome when you get to step back when you're done and mm -hmm. admire your work. Right, I bet. And I mean, at this point, you're breaking records, right? Like you are the youngest street artist in the world, right? I mean, all, so you're winning. Already, you're winning in life. I need to ask you for a little bit of advice as an artist. How do I find my style? How do I figure out the thing that makes my art mine? Well, you can try and compare it to other artists' art mm -hmm. and see what makes it different. Right. And when you feel like drawing, if you have something specific you want to draw sometimes, mm -hmm. or if if you don't, then you sometimes you just put your hand on the paper and draw whatever you want to draw. Mm -hmm. And if you draw something like lots of times, then that's probably the thing that you're best at drawing. And mm -hmm. I like to say that everybody has their own style, yeah. even though sometimes other people have a hard time saying that they do or that, or have a hard time finding it. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that one of your walls was Miyazaki's Totoro and a couple other things. Can you tell me about your process going from like drawing that out to putting it on the wall? Is that how you do it or do you just paint it? Yeah, well I draw it on the paper mm -hmm. sometimes like a few times just to make it look right and give me practice mm -hmm. for how I'm going to make it. And then on the wall sometimes it looks a bit different like mm -hmm. The Totoro I did on the paper, which is now in my sister's room ab above her bed. And so I made that one a little crooked and the face, face looked different. Mm -hmm. But when I made the bigger version, it looked more like Totoro and it wasn't crooked. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of the same, mostly the same. Right. And there's just like little differences like that. Mm -hmm. Like I made a wall of a giant version of me with a like a spray can like that. Yeah. And I called it Spray Girl. <laughs> That's and, a good title. And I, so I made like a face with light brown hair, mm -hmm. and then like it turned out to be dark brown. Mm -hmm. The eyes turned out to be bigger. I added some details to the mask. Right. So there's always a little bit changing mm -hmm. on your wall, um, then your then your actual first drawing and it's also hard to come up with the ideas sometimes I bet I bet it's hard to come up with an idea sometimes but if you're looking at other people's drawings and paintings and getting inspiration from them like that's a good way to just practice even if you don't necessarily have your own idea yet right or at least that's the way I think of it you once said in an interview I think what I paint is what I want to say could you tell us more about that, like what you're trying to say through your painting? Sure, it's like 
when you paint, it, it feels like you're telling the, like, whoever looks at it something. Like, there was, like, I went to see some art outside. Mm -hmm. I forgot who it belonged to, but it looked very pretty, and it made me think of the, it was like pop-up, and made me think of the, mm -hmm. like, states. Like, there was a blue one with what looked like years. It made me think of Antarctica and the movie Nausicaa from mm. Studio, Studio Ghibli. And there was other orange, yellow, and red ones. Mm -hmm. And that made me think of like Arizona and the desert. And so I think that the artist was trying to express like um, with the colors which maybe like a drawing mm -hmm. or a place. And basically, whenever you look at a piece of art, it like it might not be what the artist was trying to express, mm -hmm. but it's your own feeling about okay. the art. And that's kind of what I meant. Like whenever people walk by my art, it's like they might not think that it's a giant portrait of me. They can think like it's a girl that maybe it could be her friend. It right. could be a twin if she had a twin. It can it can be anything. Wow, I love that. So you've tagged a few Brooklyn neighborhoods so far, but is there one that you really want to that you haven't yet? Well, I like tagging all over the world. All like, over the world. Well, girl, correct me. Where do you want to go next in the world to tag? Probably California or yeah. or maybe Japan. Oh yeah. And. I already did it in Miami during the Art Basel. It was my second wow. wall. And I did one in France. Like, it wasn't really a wall, but it's right. kind of like, I just brought a few spray markers along. Yeah. And I just went to the beach. It was this giant, empty wall. I just started drawing my, a portrait of my sister on it. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a wall because it was pretty big and, right. and it was like drawn on a wall. I love that. Are there any cool projects you're working on right now that I could be looking out for? Because I'm going to want to follow what you're up to and really enjoy the rest of your art career. Well, there's Spray Girl that's in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. And that's like where I paint my main stuff. Mm -hmm. I just paint over each one. Oh, each cool. one lasts about a year or two. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know where else I'm going to paint, but. If you look on my Instagram, you can find lots of things about me, like right. photos of my past walls, the walls mm -hmm. like in France. I made two images of my sister. Wow. They're both kind of different. Mm -hmm. It's just something to check out. And what's your Instagram handle real quick? It's like at Lola the Illustrator. At Lola the Illustrator. Lola, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. And I only hope that I can live up to being even half the artist you are. Thanks. And also, I'm really glad to be here because I've had lots of interviews, but each one is different in some way. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like you forget interviews real quick. You don't. You don't. You'll remember this one forever. I will. See you next time. You too. Thanks for joining us today. Next week, we'll be back to talk DACA, now that the deadline for a congressional fix has passed. A debate over the merits of social media, that'll be fun. And empowering women and looking out for their rights. Hope to see you then. Have a great weekend.